Hello everyone and welcome to the Speculative Wildlife Research Center, where we reimagine creatures and monsters from all realms of fiction through the lens of speculative biology. And today we are taking a look at leprechauns. Leprechauns are small, mischievous supernatural beings from Irish folklore, usually depicted as being bearded, wearing fancy clothes and granting wishes to those who capture them. And with St. Patrick's Day, the day of the Saint Patron of Ireland, having just passed, we have a golden opportunity to talk about these fellas and see what they could be like as real living animals. So here's a thank you to everyone who wanted to see this creature and to our patrons and channel members for their support. If you too are enjoying our videos, please consider supporting the channel by liking and subscribing, joining our patron or becoming a channel member to get early looks at all our creatures. Now, without further ado, let's get started. While there are many creatures we have met that were considered to be supernatural, and as many as there are yet to come, the truth is that most animals we often consider to be something unnatural are often the result of us not understanding them well enough. And that is certainly the case of the supernatural gold hoarders we will meet today. Leprechauns Leprechauns, belonging to genus Insul Bellator, are closely related to other species of giant bees, such as, ironically, dwarfs, reaching similar sizes of 1 meter or 3 feet tall. They are fossorial bees, easily digging deep burrows thanks to the development of two shovel-shaped edges at the sides of their anterior limbs, as well as a sharp shield on its head that helps it move the substrate as it digs. And, in contrast with other giant bees, the leprechauns are much more predatory, adapted to hunt living prey thanks to their much longer mandibles, lighter body, and legs adapted to running, which they do in a hexapodal stance using all six feet. They stalk their prey from the vegetation, aided by their reddish fur and exoskeleton, as well as golden and red spots and patterns that help them blend in with the sun-mottled shadows. While incredibly smart, leprechauns pale in comparison to their dwarven or arctic relatives. They are very cunning predators, true but their intelligence did not develop past the level of similar-sized predators, including mammals such as wolves and some felines, and this happened due to a very specific reason. Their solitary living, which never favored intelligence, planning or organization beyond a certain point. Leprechauns are solitary and highly territorial, and rather than depending on a vast colony to help them gather resources and protect their nest, they must do this by themselves. And protect it they must, for its larvae and food storages, both packed with nutrients, are highly sought after by other animals. Lacking the protection of a colony, leprechauns tend to avoid direct confrontation, depending instead on closely following intruders on their territory, making unsettling noises or throwing things at them in order to scare them off or, at the very least, annoy them enough for them to leave. They are, indeed, much less aggressive than other similar species like the dwarfs or other animals that share their habitat, such as fairies. Whenever they are cornered, However, they will be forced to defend themselves, which they will do by standing on their heads and displaying their stinger, in hopes that it will be enough to drive away the threat. This, however, is only done by females, as males do not have a stinger and depend exclusively on hiding or using their so-called pranks to repel intruders. All of this hassle is worth it for the sake of protecting their gold, or at least that's the name given to it in reference to its value. In reality, leprechaun gold is a mix of pollen and nectar, quite unrefined compared to actual honey, but incredibly nutritious and useful for its medicinal properties. 
While leprechauns are predatory, this gold is useful both as a reserve during winter and as a source of food for the leprechaun's larvae. This substance is, in fact, so valuable that it has led to lots of people attempting to ambush or follow leprechauns back to their nests in order to steal their hoard. After all, despite being predators, they are still weak and small compared to a well-prepared human. However, this still requires outstealthing a predator, a task much easier said than done. Leprechauns, thanks to their sharp senses, will easily detect whoever is after them and escape without issues thanks to their great speed and agility, easily getting lost in the vegetation. Yet, there have been times when these animals have been caught by human beings, usually through well-set traps. But this requires already knowing where the leprechaun's burrow is found, and the leprechaun will usually leave and make its nest elsewhere in order to avoid this from repeating. All in all, one may think that trying to get the leprechaun's gold is more trouble than it is worth, and the locals seem to have agreed. That's why, being animals that produce a very valuable resource, humanity took to domesticating them. While not very different from the wild leprechaun, domesticated leprechauns are certainly smaller, and are characterized by their bright green coloration, which was considered very appealing. This, of course, is the leprechaun species we are currently seeing, Insulbellator viridorsum which will make gold that is easily harvested by its handlers, feeding it in turn so that the depletion of its food storage does not put it at risk. However, even this solution was not without its problems. Despite their differences, wild leprechauns have been known to approach human settlements during mating season, the one time of year when they seek others of their kind. While not immediately dangerous to humans, these wild leprechauns have been known to steal food and even some small objects and trinkets that pique their curiosity. Interestingly, these incursions led to a time when it was believed an unknown species of genus Insulbellator roamed Ireland, an urban specialist species that thrived within the homes and businesses of human beings, tentatively called Insulbellator urbanus, or Chloricon. However, these sightings turned out to be of regular leprechauns, who had become enamored with human liquor and had been raiding bars and pubs to steal these drinks. Leprechauns, like many other species of bee, including dwarven bees, are capable of becoming drunk, and seem to relish the experience. And, Without any colony or guards to keep them from doing so, leprechauns have become repeat offenders, often plundering human settlements for this purpose. And that's it for a speculative biology look into leprechauns. And this one was, not gonna lie, a bit challenging. While the idea of leprechaun bees to add to our other bearded humanoid bees, Santa Claus and the dwarves, was present from quite a while ago in our Discord server, the process was a bit more complex once we got to the finer details. See, despite the way they are usually depicted in modern media, originally leprechauns were known for wearing red rather than green clothes. And while there are other supernatural beings known for wearing green clothes, they were distinctly not leprechauns. At least according to my research, that is. It seems the green clothes of leprechauns were a more recent invention, but one that is so characteristic of these beings that depicting them without it would have not looked right. At first I thought about making red and green leprechaun different species, but a great idea by patron Alec Foisy got me to think of them as a result of domestication, which worked great given their more recent artificial nature. 
Another thing I'd like to mention is why these leprechauns are such close relatives of dwarves. As I researched, I found them to be much more close to the classic mythological image of dwarves, already discussed in their own video, including their appearance and affinity for gold and crafting, a similarity that has also been recognized by some folklorists. Hence, it worked great as a follow-up for this clade of creatures, and I really like how the final design came out. I hope you enjoyed this episode as well. And remember, if there's any type of creature you'd like me to give the speculative biology treatment in the show, please sound off in the comments below. Thank you all for watching, and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.